Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's July 4th, 2016. I'm David Knight. Here are our top stories. We celebrate the 4th of July as a reminder of earning our independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government. Just a reminder to the Obama administration, there's plenty of room on the calendar for another holiday. And all you ISIS people threatening us, hey, we're not a French newspaper, okay? We got people that have taken your asses out in this building right now. We're armed to the teeth, and we're not scared. You got that, you sons of bitches? This is Texas. You want to threaten me, you can go straight to hell. You understand that? Never water yourself down just because someone can't handle you at 100 proof. It's the Alex Jones Show, because there's a war on for your mind. Today is the day that Americans celebrate our Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. And of course, it's not just a day. This is something that continues every day. It was when we laid out the basis of government from our American perspective. That is that government is there to protect our liberties, our God-given rights. And when a government destroys those liberties, it is our right, it is our duty to alter or abolish that government. That's essentially what happened in Great Britain, interestingly enough, about 10 days ago. They declared their independence from a European superstate that is metastasizing like the cancer it is. Now, we're going to have another opportunity in America. As I point out, this is not something that was 200 and some odd years in the past. This is an ongoing struggle to keep our freedom. We're going to have an election in America. And the issue before us is the same one that was put before the British people. And that is, are we going to be ruled by a globalist cabal of politicians and multinational corporations that write our rules for us, that write our laws for us, that we have absolutely no control over. That's what is coming up with the Trans-Pacific, the Transatlantic Partnerships. We've already seen glimpses of that with NAFTA. We understand that it is sold to us as an economic opportunity, but it is really opportunism by the globalists who use it for political consolidation. The game is up. We understand what you're doing. And the British understand that, we understand that in America. We have a very clear choice before us. We're going to either vote for Hillary Clinton and the globalist elite, the political elite of both, of both parties, Democrats and Republicans, who support the globalism that we've had from both of them, or we can vote for Trump. He has opposed this consistently for over 30 years. But I first wanna take a look at how this all came about. You know. Got a lot of people going back, doing a post-mortem on this, saying, what happened? You know, what's the matter? The, the Europeans, especially the Germans, very angry at the Tory party. Why did they allow this referendum on whether they were going to have independence? Interestingly enough, it wasn't really their idea. Yes, uh, they proposed it because they saw Nigel Farage and UKIP coming up in the rearview mirror. But where did it happen? When did it happen? Well, we learned that it happened back in May of 2012, about four years before they had the election. It was after an economic summit in Chicago, and then Prime Minister David Cameron and some of his staff that were with him were eating in a pizzeria in the Chicago airport. And the British press was absolutely amazed. They said, look at this. They've had all of this heavy security, you know, like we see at Bilderberg and uh, the G7 groups, and they had this heavy security around these people, and yet here they are, just eating in an ordinary uh, pizzeria. We think it was a Pizzeria Uno from everybody's best guess. Here they are just having pizza. So it was widely reported at the time. And then later they learned that this is where they decided to hold the Brexit referendum in order to keep UKIP from coming at them and overtaking them, as I point out in the rearview mirror. Now I can imagine perhaps how this happened. You know, they're here at the pizzeria place and maybe somebody came up to them and said, uh, do you want it to go? They said, yes, that's it. We'll do takeout. And from <laughs> From that idea, they had Brexit. Now, it was interesting, and I think we need to focus. So we're going to talk about the lies from David Cameron as he's represented uh, Brexit and how we've now seen this European superstate in the a week after they had the vote. All the things that he was saying were not true. We're now seeing those things come out as being revealed as true. But first, I want to take a, a look at the man who really made this happen. He took a victory lap at the European Parliament, and this is what he had to say. You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? 
And the reason you're so upset, the reason you're so angry, has been perfectly clear from all the angry exchanges this morning. You, as a political project, are in denial. Now, as Farage pointed out, they always offer it as an economic opportunity. But what they do is they create an economic crisis. We've seen this game over and over again, crisis, solution. And the solution is more political union. And as he pointed out, they even have the Lisbon Treaty. He said they brought that sovereignty in the back door even when Netherlands and France said we don't want any part of it. Now, as we had the lead up to the Brexit vote, I think it's very interesting to analyze what was said by David Cameron just before the vote and what was revealed just after the vote. Here's David Cameron talking about the lies of UKIP. People are getting through the letterboxes, leaflets from leave saying, basically, Turkey's gonna join the EU, not true. There's gonna be a European army with Britain in it, not true. And we give 350 million pounds a week to Brussels, not true. Now look, if we wanna to vote to leave this organization, let's vote to leave it, but let's not do it on the basis of three things that are completely untrue. All right, well, let's just... Okay, we now see just a week later that those lies, and the key one I wanna focus on is the European army. We see now that that was true. It was not a lie. He said, if you're going to get out, uh, get out for other reasons, but these reasons that are being given are just simply not true. Well, we saw this narrative being put out by Politico, by The Guardian. The Guardian put out about a month before, said, uh, is there a secret plan to create a European army? It's like, no, no, not actually. Politico said, are they, we're going to wage war on the myth of a European army. They say Brexiteers are tapping into deep-rooted tropes of Euro skepticism guaranteed to alarm the British public. And of course, one of those tropes was that there was going to be a European super state with an army, which we now see is true. Uh, they say, well, going back to March 2015, this is Politico articles, uh, European Commission President Juncker advocated a common European army as a way to increase the EU standing on the world stage not least in the eyes of Russia. So even they admitted at that point, well, yes, they've made a lot of statements about this. And of course, they've been widely reported in multiple areas what they wanted to do. But they said, just as David Cameron said about Turkey, and we didn't have the clip there, but he goes on to say in that uh, meeting where he was being questioned by the public, he said, uh, oh, Turkey, yeah, yeah, I would love to have Turkey in, but it ain't gonna happen for another 30 years, okay? <laughs> but it would happen. And this is going to happen. They've already laid out the plans for this. Now, going back to what The Guardian said about a month before the Brexit vote, they said EU army plans kept secret from voters. They said that was a front page story on Friday's Times. And if the claim sounded familiar, that was because just two days earlier, a retired British army commander had claimed in the Daily Express that the EU was moving inexorably towards full political union and all that comes with it, including a unified armed forces. And then they go on to say, is there a serious ch imminent chance of this happening? Oh, no, said the Guardian, okay? They said EU defense policy remains in the hands of European governments, not the EU executive. Contrary to purport, reports, it will not propose an EU army. Okay, now. That was a month before Brexit. Less than a week after Brexit, we had a Polish television uh, network release a detailed document that was put together by France and by Germany, by the foreign ministers of both of those countries. Now, this document was not written over the weekend. It was released on the Monday following the Brexit vote. This was something that had been developed for quite some time. They don't produce documents like this in these massive bureaucracies as a joint statement between two foreign ministers of two countries without a lot of advanced preparation. So at the time, all this was being downplayed in the press. They were well into this document. I want to look at this document with you and ask you to honestly think about this. Are they talking about creating a European army under an executive power? And we will see very clearly that they are. Now, here's some excerpts from that. They say, our two countries, that's France and Germany, uh, share a common destiny. We will therefore move further towards political union, political union in Europe. And we will invite other Europeans to join us in the endeavor. Well, you see, there's not about political union, they say. They go on to say, France and Germany will therefore promote a more coherent and more assertive Europe on the world stage. They're going to project power, folks. They say the main challenges ensure the security of our citizens confronted with growing external and internal threats. We want to establish a stable cooperative framework for dealing with migration and refugee flows. 
boost the European economy, so forth and so on, and move towards the completion of economic and monetary union. So now this is all still about political union, a closer, tighter European superstate. Now we go to the next section, a European security compact. This is where the army comes in. They say conflict is being imported into our continent. By who? <laughs> by the European Union. The terrorist threat is growing, feeding on complex networks inside and outside Europe and stemming from crisis zones. Providing security for Europe, as well as contributing to peace and stability globally, is at the heart of the European project. And of course, the European project is just a step towards a global world government. We see the EU, they go on to say, as a key power in its neighborhood, but also as an actor for peace and stability with global reach, tackling global challenges, a rules-based international order underpinned by strategic stability. Think about that. This is all about globalism, folks. This is not even about a European superstate. This is about a world superstate. They are a building block toward that. This is why they hate to see it unraveling as it appears that it may. They're talking about global challenges and they're talking about a rules-based international order. Who's gonna write those rules? The same people that write our secret treaties that our elected representatives are not even allowed to read, okay? Now, they say to respond to this challenge, Germany and France propose a European security compact, which encompasses all aspects of security and defense dealt with at the European level. They go on to say, France and Germany will promote the EU as an independent and global actor able to leverage its unique array of expertise, tools, civilian and military. Now, they go on. The EU should be able to plan and conduct civil and military operations more effectively with the support of a permanent civilian military chain of command. Do you understand that? A permanent civilian military chain of command. The EU should be able to rely on employable high readiness forces, provide common financing for its operation. How are they going to do that? They will have European Union super state taxes. Within the framework of the EU, member states will establish permanent structured cooperation in the field of defense. EU member states should consider establishing a standing maritime force. Understand this. They're talking about a permanent standing army. They're talking about a permanent standing navy. They'll be able to project military force, okay? And they are also talking about an executive who is going to control that. Then they tackle their other objective, and that is their migration policy. They say there shall be no unilateral national answers to the migration challenge. In other words, folks, the individual nation states are not going to have a say. This is all going to be done by the centralized European government. They also talk about completing economic and monetary union. Now understand they're going to have a full-time European president. They say they're going to harmonize regulation and oversight as well as corporate taxation. All the taxes, all the regulations are going to come from there, including common social minimum standards. It is a complete European state. Now they have tried to do everything they can to mess with the markets, to scare people about this, to try to get them to back down. But you need to understand and look at the way Nigel Farage addressed the European Parliament. He made it very clear that it was in the interest of everyone to move forward and just to have a real economic union, which is the way this started. Here's what he had to say. Between your countries and my country, we do an enormous amount of business in goods and services. That trade is mutually beneficial to both of us. That trade matters. If you were to decide to cut off your noses, to spite your faces, and to reject any idea of a sensible trade deal, the consequences would be far worse for you than it would be for us. So this is a European superstate. This is what they said was not going to happen. And yet we all knew that it was there and we've been proven right. And this is the issue before the British people as they're dragging this out, as they're going to tell people, you don't want to do this. You have to understand you were lied to once before and they are trying to still trick you. You need to follow through on this. Now, when we come back, we're going to have Jakari Jackson, Joe Biggs and Michael Zimmerman talk about what it's like to be reporters in the midst of a riot, because we are going to have reporters that are going to be in the midst, I think, of a couple of riots not only the Republican, but also the Democrat convention, I think are going to be uh, quite uh, dangerous this year. They're gonna to talk to you when we come back about what it's like to be in the middle of that. Stay with us, we'll be right back. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman 
saw a poor, half-frozen snake. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Oh, well, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Sighed the vicious snake. This could be the great Trojan horse of all time. Because you look at the migration, study it, look at it. Now they'll start infiltrating with women and children. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Sighed the vicious snake. Now she clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in, by now you might have died. She stroked his pretty skin, and then she kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, that snake gave her a vicious bite. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bit me, heavens why. You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. Thank you for joining us on this July 4th weekend. I'm joined in studio by Joe Biggs and also Michael Zimmerman. We're going to be talking about some of the things that have happened, not just this year, but pretty much our InfoWars experience as we go around the country. We go to various events, rallies, and sometimes they turn into flat-out riots. Now, one of, the things, uh, one of the things we've been covering quite extensively here over the past year, the things going on at these Donald Trump rallies. Uh, some of them are very peaceful, some of them not so much. So, Joe Biggs, let's talk about your experience, start off in Dallas and some of the things that you saw there. Yeah, so the actual first Trump rally we ever attended was myself and Matt Weber. It was a little over a year ago. It was his first rally. It was in Dallas. And, uh, you know, we went inside. It's pretty intense. You know, the crowd re was reacting really good. And I had no idea what was happening on the outside. I didn't know there was going to be protests at it, really. I mean, we just went to go cover Trump speaking. Right. And, you know— we walk out and Weber's getting his camera stuff ready and all you see are these cops on horses and they're like jumping up and down and there's probably like, you know, 100, 150 people maybe out there in front of the police line screaming and yelling, waving these Mexican flags and you saw some of the communist flags and Black Lives Matter and all that and I'm sitting there like, what is going on mm -hmm. for, for, for this? A rally. For a rally? And it just spiraled out of control from there. I mean, we've all covered almost every single one of them. Between the three of us and Josh Owens and Rob Dew, mm -hmm. things have gotten intense and they've Absolutely. gotten downright violent. And the propaganda being pushed by the mainstream media about what's really going on has gotten so out of control that so, pe like so many people are confused about what's really going on at these rallies. The fact that people are trying to go in and out to go see a presidential candidate speak, and yet what's happening as they come out, they're being spit on, mm -hmm. harassed, assaulted. You know, it, it's crazy. It definitely is that. Now, Michael, I know we've gone to some of these things as well, and you've also gone to ones that I wasn't there. So can you tell us about some of those experiences? Yeah, one uh, recent one was in Richmond, Virginia. You had a bunch of communist protesters show up. They're waving their, uh, communists or anarchists, they're waving their flags around, and they just started attacking these Trump supporters that are walking through. And I think what you're talking about, this, this media narrative, uh, has really got out of control. They're trying to blame this on these Trump supporters that are just trying to go hear a politician speak. And they show up to these events and they're getting attacked. It, it, it's an empowering. It's empowering these people that go out and carry out these attacks because they know nothing's going to happen to them. Yeah. They turn on the TV at the end of the night to get like that, that, that rush, that high. Like, did I make the cut? Am I on there? And all they hear is peaceful protesters clash with racist Donald Trump supporters. And these guys are like, wow, I just punched somebody. I damn near killed somebody mm -hmm. and I got away with it and no one's saying anything. Let's keep doing this. And from there it exploded. Well, you see the media spin because when Michael and myself went out to Albuquerque, that was a scenario where the Trump supporters, where they went into the building rather, you know, fine, calm. But then you had a group of protesters, demonstrators, who came out there and they rushed the barricades. They run up to the front door, start trying to kick in the door, and it just got worse from there. Let's take a look at that video.
just one aspect of what happened that night. Yeah, the, the behavior of these people is just frankly disgusting. They were screaming at families, you know, fathers carrying their, their young daughters, yelling, F you, your kid is gonna burn in Trump's camps. I mean, these people are just so far out there. A lot of them, you know, being bussed in. We talked to one guy as we were leaving, one of the more violent protesters that we saw, you and I both saw him throwing rocks. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh man, I missed my bus. <laughs> yeah, that guy was ridiculous uh, because, yeah, we, we were out there, and this isn't the guy who hit me with a rock. This is a different guy, but he's out there throwing rocks and stuff at the cops. I'm like, so when they start shooting the gas and, you know, possibly rubber bullets, you're going to be on the front line when they start, you know, firing back. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be here. And then what does he do in the back of the night? He's way back there behind everybody else. And this is the mentality of the people who go out there to these events. Yeah, I think it's just like it's, it's a thrill for them maybe. I, I don't think they actually believe that they're accomplishing anything. You know, I think it's these people who just want to be violent for the, the sake of violence. Mm. It's an excuse to act violent. Right. Well, same thing, you know, like uh, you were talking about Ferguson earlier. And, you know, people will riot and they'll burn down, you know, shops and businesses that are owned by their the you know, neighborhood in their community. It's yeah, your neighborhood. And that's You're a good, good way to segue because uh, Biggs and I, we went out to Ferguson. And uh, one of the things that was very interesting the night they gave the verdict on, uh, on the officer, you know, what was going to happen to him. You know, the guy, uh, I believe it's Michael Brown's a stepdad, he jumps up in the car, he's like, let's burn this mother effer down. And then he goes home. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and then people start burning stuff down. Uh, guys are raiding uh, cell phone shops like, I got to do this for Michael Brown. I'm like, you didn't do any of this for Michael Brown. I was standing in front of the fire department, remember? Because yeah. I was doing the show live. I was sitting there walking, I had the tripod or whatever set up. And as soon as he said that, because they were right in the road in front of us, and he stand up on that car, it was him and his wife, which was Michael Brown's mom mom or whatever, they were sitting there and he jumps up and screams and then all you saw was everyone disperse, yeah. just run. All the people who knew what was about to happen, mm -hmm. all people that stayed were media, 
cops and the people that are there to burn that town down, and they did that. I remember glass shattering across the street at oh, that yeah. cell phone spot. Then someone threw a bottle over my head, and it shattered. Remember that yeah. uh, glass at the fire department mm-hmm. behind me? And I'm sitting here like, wow, this is about to happen. You know, that's what some of the most intense riding I think any of us have been to, but it's gotten close, like Costa Mesa, Josh yeah. Owens, those guys are down there. People jumping in the cars like we saw in Ferguson, doing donuts, almost hitting bystanders. I mean, that's out of control. Yeah, bloodying the, the faces of yeah, Trump supporters. Yeah, hitting people in the face. I mean, this kid was just like dripping blood. Yeah. Why? For what? Because you want to make America Mexico again? Get the F out of here. Well, and Look, here's what happens in a war. You lose. The people who win take the land. That's how it is. Get over. Don't be a sore loser. This is not going to be Mexico again. This is America. Fourth of July. Roger that. That's real sad. He's against you. Why will you? Why will you support a racist? He's going to send you back to Africa. That's what he said. He said send Mexicans back to Mexico. You. You are just shit. You are a disgrace to America. Thank you. For being a young black man Thank supporting you. a racist. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. That's sad. That is awesome. How does your parents feel about you holding a Trump sign? Other Trump fans. Where they disgrace to America, America, America too, because he doesn't like you or your All parents. All my friends are immigrants. You didn't answer my question. Yeah, you didn't ask our question. What has he said? He said send Mexicans back to Mexico. No, he said. He said Mexico. don't let Muslims here. Yeah, he said. Why? He's, are you going to let me talk or are you going to yell? No, I'm telling you because you're you holding this Trump thing and you so need to be taught. We can't have conversation, can we? We cannot do that, right? And then oh, kids okay, are okay. Okay. telling you well, against your own people. She just graduated high school, so she's not a kid no more. Okay. I, I what would you tell him when a racist tell send Mexican back to Mexico? What would you tell a young black I, man? I only believe that he's going to send illegals back. I, yeah, exactly. He said in your way, he said. send Mexican back yeah. to Mexico. He said Mexico. illegals. Just illegals. Illegals only. And Please, he's, he's his not wife legal. is not he's legal. legal. She's from Europe. She's legal. She's legal. How she, what, she was born she has, in Europe. Okay, why would she, she have a U.S. citizenship? I think she's running for president. But she has U.S. citizenship, so that, that's just because she was born in another country does not mean she has a legal right, citizenship. That's, 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 that's fine, you, you don't have to. You're a real lad. If yeah. he's and elected, I say the same thing about he you, would be against you because, because of your skin and color, young man. And you're probably like 30-something, but you're, 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 you're not really a 16-year-old he's against for his candidate. People. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Go listen to him speak, yeah. and he'll prove you wrong. There are many black yeah. people who support Trump. Plenty of them. I think guy. it's VP so might be black. How many? Oh, how about you? Once at that rally, you see a lot of black people. You know what? The media won't show you that, though. In there, going to stand up against Trump. Okay. You More sure, black. sure about that? What sure about, about, about that? Black people that he asked his, his security guards to kick out of the rally. Oh, and Val, Val, Val also State? Yeah. Tell about, oh, yeah. they were protesting against him. Yeah. What is, what is that? You that cannot sh- protest in a, in a rally. Then why would you do that? Why? It's freedom of speech. We don't go to your rally. White people. We don't go to your rally. He, he does the same thing to white people, people too. So I don't understand. Yeah. He does the exact same thing to white people too. So. And that's a, that, that makes it okay. I mean, you, if, if, they don't if, you're, if you're going to protest against us, yeah. Well, yeah. If you don't like Trump supporters, <laughs> like, freedom of protest, okay. you should go get educated on what's important. Oh, I'm very educated, yeah. ma'am. I'm, I'm very educated. We're being that's educated. really that's sad. Why we came sad that you were born. Because we learned about our sad. 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 What did you graduate with? What's your degree? What did you graduate with? Th- that's not the question. Okay. That's the question. Are you educated in economics? Are you educated in any sort yeah. of political background? I've worked on many campaigns, and it's so sad. It's very vague. That's, it's very sad. One campaign. I've it's very worked, sad that you're being so vague. I worked for so our president twice. Okay. The, yes. One of the worst yes. guys yes. ever. Yes. But okay. oh, oh, yeah, one of the worst guys ever. Let's look at the condition of our country. This country hey, was here. built on love, not hate. Donald Trump is a hater. That's fine. He's a racist. He's not. He's not. He is a racist. No, no, no. He's getting, you know, and you know this country is built on religion, too, yeah, not religion. He believes in hate. You know this country. You know the religion. history of his grandfather and father. Oh they were KK members. Oh, this, they own real estate in New York. How do you know that? Go, go Google it. I don't no, you Google it because you're facts are very Donald Trump family. Family. You have very horrible facts. You come to me with black and Jews and properties in New York. Where he bought real estate. Okay, look it up for myself. Tell me what the history of Donald Trump family. That's what his grandfather and his father was KK members. Okay, you know what? Let's look it up for ourselves. Okay, 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 let's look it up for
That's good. The people are united. We'll never be defeated. Okay. And that's what I believe in. And Trump, Donald Trump, Trump trying to divide the country. He's not trying to divide us. Yes, he is. He's trying to unite us. Yes, he is. Just because his policies are not like yours doesn't mean he's not trying to unite What do you mean, quality? Yes, I said policies. Policy? Yes, yes. What you're saying that means. We're a versatile. Massacres to he gonna build a wall to send what do them you mean back why? to their country. We have so much illegal immigration. That's why. Look at his wife. How do you think she got here? She's legal. She's, legal. Oh, She's not legal. Yeah, she She's is. from Europe. She There's a way to legally immigrate. Exactly. Do you She's not? Do you not know that? Yeah. You don't yeah. know that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! It's not my grandparents. Yeah, because you don't know anything. You need to go to my house, spell your first name, go to college, get a high school education, and then you come back and talk to me. Thank you. Do you know his own party oh, no, is no, no, coming no. against him? Go get a high school education. Because of the racist he's teaching. Go get a high school education. There are plans here in Texas to put through a high-speed bullet train going from Houston to Dallas. Now, that may sound like a good thing, and it could be a good thing, except that it's turning into the people who are in between the two cities, people in the rural areas, are literally being railroaded out of their private property rights. And without private property rights, you are nothing but a slave. This is another case of eminent domain. And we've seen through Supreme Court decisions with the Kello decision, others, where increasingly eminent domain is being used, not necessarily for public use, but for the private use of a corporation. And then we see with the Keystone Pipeline and now with this Japanese bullet train that is going to be built in Texas that they're working on, we're seeing that being handed over to a multinational corporation. Now, there's also been a bait and switch as we've seen this uh, project develop here in Texas. We're going to talk to uh, one of the judges, one of the county judges and one of the counties affected by this. And of course, a county judge in Texas is really the chief administrator. He's kind of like uh, a mayor of a city. Uh, the county judge has that kind of a position in the counties here in Texas. We're talking to uh, Judge Trey Duhon of Waller County, and he's going to outline to us what the problems are with this, because this is a national issue. And it is an issue that this country was built upon. This is the issue of whether or not you will be allowed to own and enjoy the rights to your property or whether somebody who has better political connections is going to be able to take that from you at their will. Joining us now is Judge Trey Duhan. Judge, thank you for joining us. Thank you, David, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, let's, let's give people an idea of how this has come about. Because a few years ago, uh, the people in these counties, when it was sold to them originally, they said, hey, this, this sounds like a good idea. Maybe this would be something that would be helpful. But at that time, they said it would be going over existing right-of-ways that were already being used by roadbeds, by power lines, and that sort of thing. But then they changed that. That's right. I mean, you know, when this first came about several years ago, because we, we've been engaged now in, in this fight now for going on, I think, four years, um, that was one of the things that a lot of folks felt pretty strong about, that if you're going to build something of this nature, you should build it along existing infrastructure um, rather than going out to an area um, that has a certain way of life and just taking land and condemning it and turning it into something it's it's, it's not. Um, obviously, with a bullet train, um, it comes along with a lot of other things that is not consistent with some of the things that we have here in Waller County. Um, obviously, Waller County is a, a we've always been an agricultural county. Um, we have a, a very strong rural um, and agricultural heritage. And uh, we do have a lot of growth going on in Waller County, being that we're adjacent to, to Houston. Um, but the areas that they're trying to run this train through, um, it would just create a dead zone. Um, instead of being prime residential development or mixed retail or other uses, um, any land adjacent to this project is going to the highest and best use might be, you know, grazing or yeah. agricultural. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a problem for a lot of folks in Waller County. And of course, what it is also is a case of the rights of the few uh, being taken by the multitude and uh, the way in which they're doing this. You have a lot of concerns about the process that they're going through with eminent domain and the fact that they're trying to take this property when they haven't even decided on the exact route yet. They're going to take uh, property for a couple of different routes and they routes that they won't even use. 
Yeah, that, that's right. And I, and I tell you, uh, it, it is disconcerting for, for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, you've got you've got the two elephants uh, in the room with Houston and Dallas that think that this would be the greatest thing, you know, since white bread. Um, and they're pushing very hard uh, for this project. And the problem is that we have a number of issues with, with the project. I mean, number one, none of us really believe that this project is going to cash flow. Um, it's being sold. Uh, the taxpayers are being told that this will be built with, with private money. But the fact of the matter is nobody can actually tell us if it's going to be operated that way or if the state of Texas will eventually have to subsidize this because there's really no high-speed rail lines in the world that aren't publicly subsidized to some extent. Yes. Uh, it's not a mass transit solution, not at the ticket prices they propose. You're not going to get the ridership that you need when you can travel between Dallas and Houston on a $50 tank of gas. Why would a family of four pay over $1,000 for that same trip? So we have a number of issues, but, but what has really come to a head that is ex incredibly troubling um, is the actions of the, the rail company, Texas Central Railway, in filing these recent petitions with the Surface Transportation Board, where they are in effect asking to be exempted from certain regulations and requirements so that they can have the power of condemnation prior to the route being finalized and prior to the environmental analysis being completed, which, by the way, we, ha we have a major problem with the way they've done the environmental analysis, because we don't think what they're doing is in accordance with NEPA. But, you know, that's just that's a, a major side note. But, you know, to, to think that and, and to go so far as to even admit that you may take property that you may not eventually use in the final route. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's tyranny, to be honest with you. I can't imagine. I mean, there has to be a public necessity. Yes. That's a basic tenet uh, when you're going to exercise eminent dom domain. Yes. And if you're taking land that's not going to be used in the final route, where's the public necessity in that? Well, I have a problem with the fact that it's a private company that's going to take it. I mean, you and I both don't believe that this is truly going to be a private company. What they will do is they will privatize their profits but if they lose money, as we always see with these massive crony capitalist projects, if they lose money, that's going to be put on the public, on the taxpayer. Uh, but at the same time, if it is a private proper, a private uh, corporation that's running this thing through, uh, I don't even believe that they ought to be able to take it for the eminent domain. Uh, but it's gotten beyond that. As we see, that first the private corporations take that, and then we have a multinational corporation, like in the case of Keystone Pipeline, comes in and says, well, we're going to take your property. Now we go to the extent they say, well, we've got a couple of different routes that we want to do here, so we're just going to take all of this land, even though we may not use some of it. And then they're taking shortcuts in terms of the eminent domain process, aren't they? Uh, there's no doubt about it that they're taking shortcuts. And I'll, I'll give you just a few examples um, that I think, you know, kind of outline um, the shortcuts they're taking. They, you know, back in April, on April 19th is when they filed these petitions with the Surface Transportation Board to be exempted from certain regulations and to, to go forward and have that condemnation authority. They did, they did so at that time with no notice to landowners, cities, or counties that were affected. And then they didn't come out until, I think it was on May 4th. Um, that was 15 days after they filed it, but only five days before the deadline for comments on their petition is when TCR publicly announced that they had filed these petitions, you know, some two to wow. three earlier. And it's like, if it's an open and transparent process, which TCR says that they are doing, why, why doing this in the middle of the night without any heads up or notice to anybody? Now, thankfully, um, we are organized. We are not a bunch of backwoods we know what we're doing. We were we engaged quickly and and filed replies and responses to these petitions, along with comments from thousands of individuals that you know own property between Houston and Dallas. And and the point you made earlier, and let me say this: this this is an important issue for everyone. Everyone that that owns property, everybody that pays taxes whether this project is going to come close to you or not, because you're right. 
they will absolutely, when this thing fails, and I do believe it's not going to cash flow. Um, in fact, one of our state representatives, Cecil Bell, very interesting. Well, that's it for our news tonight. We hope that you have a wonderful 4th of July as you celebrate your freedom and your independence. And we ask you to consider supporting us so that we can continue to give you free and independent news as an independent news agency. One of the ways that you can do that is to become a subscriber to Prison Planet TV. Your subscription helps to support us financially, and as a subscriber, you will get the news every night as it happens, as well as access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries there on the Prison Planet TV website. Have a great 4th of July. Keep fighting for your liberty and join us tomorrow night, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.